Good morning and welcome to another episode of Beyond Bitcoin. My name is Derek Graham and I'm here today with Greg Galton, the Chief Analyst at Portal Asset Management. Good morning, Greg. Morning, Derek. How are you? Uh, very good indeed. Who couldn't be good? The market's moving ahead. Token 2049 was fascinating. And today we're going to talk about Breakpoint Solana, which was the event that followed Token 2049 and what we learned from that. But as a quick background, Bitcoin has now gone over $60,000. Nice to see. The Chicago Fed National Financial Conditions Index, there's another index for us to watch, has fallen down to negative 0.56%. What's the relevance of that? Because it's very loose financial conditions, they're saying, in which case they intend to loosen the availability of money. And what we do know with, with Bitcoin, and in fact with this entire asset class, is that when financial conditions lead towards the loosening of money, this is a risk-on period of time. And with these risk-on assets, cryptocurrencies tend to rise. And that's what we've seen of recent times. We've seen Ethereum rise and Solana rise in the last month. Small amounts, but they are on the way up. Ethereum sitting at $2,616. Solana's sitting at $145. I mention those because that's the topic of today. Ethereum and Solana, of course, are the two main layer one protocols regularly spoken of. Ethereum is currently sitting at a capitalization of about $315 billion, whereas Solana is sitting at about $68 billion capitalization. Ethereum was launched back in July 2015, whereas Solana was launched in March 2020. The mechanisms of how they operate are quite different. Ethereum originally was a point of work, sorry, a proof of work protocol, which was tradition of what Bitcoin was. Then it became a proof of stake protocol. And so now what we're looking at with, with uh, Solana is that it's a proof of history protocol. So with a proof of history protocol, it timestamps the creation, timestamps the transactions, creating a historical record that proves the events occurred in a particular sequence. And this improves the speed of the consensus, which is what all of this argument between Ethereum and Solana is about. Of course, we know that Ethereum operates on the Ethereum virtual machine protocol, and the transactions at the moment are estimated between 15 and 30 transactions per second. Whereas Solana's arguing the proposition that it should be able to transact around 65,000 transactions per second. There's a lot of numbers going around. But the prime thing is that the, the proof of, of stake environment, but the consensus environment that operates Ethereum is more robust um, for validation than Solana. But the Solana proof of history process is much faster and far less expensive. Um, both of them have their own languages that they program under. Um, but these days, Solana is being referred to as the number one likely Ethereum killer. Now, it's a tribal world out there, and so we constantly see the Solana tribe and the Ethereum tribe. We're neither tribe. We're just interested in what really is the most effective layer one protocol and, of course, how that affects investment. So tell us a little bit about what you thought the vibe was like at the Solana conference there in Singapore. Greg? Yeah, the vibe was, was very strong. It's, Solana Breakpoint is, is primarily aimed at developers, but it also provides an update, a, a mechanism for some of the protocols to show what they've been doing. So look, it's, it's a little bit of a crypto degen kind of environment. You know, lots of talk about meme coins but still very probably a slightly younger crowd than Token 2049, uh, probably a little bit more dynamic. And I think that's reflected in, in, in some of the protocols that you see on Solana. Solana's seen as the up and coming usurper to Ethereum. Everyone talked previously about when Ethereum would flip Bitcoin, and now people are talking about when Solana will flip Ethereum. So that's certainly probably more likely in the short term than, than Ethereum flipping Bitcoin. So the rise of, of smart contract layer one blockchains, the improvements that Solana's seen in its tech stack recently. And that's one of the key things that, that really came out of it for me was the number of protocols that are now building on Solana. The, the tech stack is now much more reliable. Yes, there have been issues with turning it off and turning it back on again, the old the classic tech trick. 
but now that you've got some serious protocols, like you make a DAO, which is rebranded the Sky, has announced yes. that they're going to be launching on, on Solana. Helium, which actually used to run its own blockchain, was one of the first to move across to Solana because of the benefits that it saw. So that, that was a very much a theme across Breakpoint was the number of protocols that are moving across to Solana. And interesting, I, I did meet a, a fintech uh, out of Sydney, actually, uh, mm -hmm. and they were investigating whether to build on Ethereum or Solana. They originally thought about Ethereum, but were swinging Mac back now towards Solana. There was a number of different reasons that they, they felt that the Ethereum devs were probably a little bit lackluster, that they weren't really interested in building, whilst the Solana devs, there's a lot more of them that, that can program in Rust were a lot more incentivized and, and, and really optimistic about the outlook for Solana. You had the PayPal, they originally launched on Ethereum and now have moved back to Solana. They realized that the cost of transacting on Ethereum was far too expensive versus the finality, the very rapid finality and the very low cost that you get on Solana. So, you know, that, that was, I thought that was the key, one of the key things to come out of, out of that conference. What's really important in these conferences is the vibe. I know that sounds extremely, you know, broad and, and generalist, but it is true because you can sense by it being in these conferences just the level of enthusiasm for one protocol versus another. Um, you can see by people's drive and their enthusiasm in this space about what's moving ahead. So that's an interesting observation you've made there, Greg, that the Solana community is very enthusiastic progressive in this space and maybe ethereum at the moment's a little lackluster my my great friend andy who's an ethereum maximalist will be angry with me for making that statement but this is typical of this world there is a degree of tribalism i was very surprised that the that solana has shut down a few times over the past couple of years and more surprised about the tolerance level for those shutdowns. Was that a view that Solana was simply rapidly developing and growing and will soon no longer have these any downtime exposure? Yeah, that, that's you've got to remember that Solana is still in beta phase. I, I probably should use the air quotes for beta phase. I've heard it described for Ethereum as well. That, and to use one of your airplane analogies, it's basically like trying to build the plane whilst you're flying it. Yes. is that you get the bare bones blockchain up and running and then you fix things as you go along now solana yeah solana has had some major outage, outages for up to eight hours at a time no information has been lost but it has been very very unfortunate that it went through those periods that is why the foundation actually approached the guys who, who were running fire dancer was to do a full audit of the chain correct any bugs that they found within within the chain and actually launch as a second validator. And that to me, it just shows the commitment that, that the Solana Foundation has to making Solana the, the premier blockchain. They realize, they see the demand that's coming as a, on the payment rails alone. They've already had, as I mentioned before, PayPal use, moving their stable coin onto Solana. You've had the agreement with Visa uh, on the Solana network. There'll be very strong collaborations between the two. Yes. And that's because Visa sees the potential, the lack of friction using a blockchain and especially the Solana blockchain in terms of doing many low cost transactions. So we, we actually did get an update from the Fire Dancer guys. They were very impressive, very technical, very yep. impressive. I won't bore you all the details, but the sort of the, the summary of it was is that they've had Fire Dancer operating as a validator on mainnet. Um, with um, a, a globally disparate uh, bunch of val validators. They're not, not all located in the same room, but spread them out across the world. And they were able to achieve a, a million transactions per second, Whoa. which is just mind blowing in terms of that tech. And they're pushing the boundaries of what we can do with physics and the speed of light and processing power. So that was very impressive. And we've always been aware of the improvements in the tech stack, but also concerned about the, the shutdowns. Uh, it certainly hasn't done anything to dull people's faith in Solana. And now with the Fire Dancer upgrade coming, hopefully very soon before the end of the year, uh, we'll, we'll see, we'll really see that dramatic improvement in Solana coming through. So, Greg, is Fire Dancer a layer two protocol, or is it a s segment of Solana upgrade? What is it? 
it's basically just just a it's just another set of validators running on the same code. So it's not a layer two. I don't think you'll see layer twos on Solana. It's too fast already, and yeah. it's so scalable. You're already seeing ZK rollups coming to layer one. Helios mm-hmm. have announced that a few a few weeks ago that they'll be running ZK rollups, which will allow fragmentation of the blockchain for even quicker off-chain processing. So yeah, I just it just gives another layer of security to the whole Solana blockchain. Now one of the one of the issues that you could have is the lack of decentralization. At the moment, it's very expensive to run a, a Solana validator. That's unlikely to change. The main cost is actually not the hardware cost, it's the Solana cost. You need about 100 Solana to break even because you're voting every one to two seconds. So you need to be validating a lot of transactions to be able to offset that cost of voting. Tolly th- thinks that it's an issue. So this is Tolly. He's the founder of Solana, the Solana blockchain. He thinks that it's an issue. He would like to lower that that cost, but then that potentially brings in, brings in the potential for bad actors who could take up and who could, who could launch a lot of processing validation power on Solana. So it's a bit of a compromise they have to go through. I think as little as 100 validators is enough to, de- to decentralize the chain. And they are looking to expand south of the border. Uh, they are looking at picking up validators in, in South America, Asia, and also Australia to, to ensure that continuity of the network. That does make sense because they're regularly criticised around this issue of being centralised versus the thoroughly decentralised Ethereum, although you could argue that it's not as decentralised. Yeah, Yeah. okay, (laughs) give us your view. (laughs) Well, my my view is that Ethereum is not decentralised in that it is subject to censoring. You have had issues in the past where the US regulatory authorities have, have enacted some form of censoring on Ethereum transactions, but also the large number of staking pools. So the Rocket Pool, the Lido Pool, they have a large amount of staked ETH within them. They are very centralized. Yeah, I'm going to probably upset a few people with this comment, but yeah, it, I don't think ETH is, is as decentralized as perhaps it should be. And I think one of the things that came out of Token 2049 was that really all the L2 developers on ETH really want is a plain and boring layer one blockchain infrastructure that they can build on. It's just sort of, it's taking away some of the gloss from ETH in, in my mind a little bit. It's still, it's a perfectly good chain, but I wouldn't be surprised to see Solana really leap in, in, in leap ahead in bounds in terms of the technology and then the amount of total value locked on the Solana blockchain. And then, and then the market caps converging and then Solana moving ahead at some point in the not too distant future. Yeah. Look, just to put this in perspective of how effective that uh, transactions per second is, again, we'll remind everybody, our viewers, that the transactions per second at Christmas time with Visa and MasterCard are somewhere between 50 to 70,000 transactions per second per card. So let's just take the max times two, 140,000 transactions per second. Here is Firedancer talking about, what, a million transactions per second. And that could be then that they could run the two biggest card transaction networks in the world, plus the Australian Stock Exchange, the Singapore Stock Exchange, and the New York Stock Exchange, potentially all simultaneously (laughs) per second. It's extraordinarily powerful. However, it's capitalised now at, I mean, if you look at Solana at its its current price, 140-odd, US dollars, a token, $68 billion, you'd have to multiply it by 4.6 times just to equal Ethereum's position. Do you think the movement towards Solana, do you think the Solana infrastructure is going to give people confidence that it really is going to outperform Ethereum? In which case, does it have the tokenomics to meet Ethereum's value currently? That's a very good point um, that, that you make there, Derek. So ETH is deflationary. It should be when fees are high enough that they're able to offset the emissions of the ETH tokens pl- paid to the validators by the fees that they generate on the system. Solana is definitely inflationary. So it's still, it's probably, it's going to reduce the inflation rate down to about 1.8%, I believe it is, in the next few years' time, in the next several years, but it still will be inflationary. Because Solana's 
benefit is probably the curse to the the protocol is the fees are so cheap. So it actually, they do burn the fees. They do burn the Solana tokens from the fees, but because the fees are so low, they would need to do 20 to 30 to 40 times the Ethereum blockchain in terms of number of transactions to yes. generate anywhere near the number of fees that Ethereum generates that it can burn its token with. We've modeled that. We don't see that sort of going into equilibrium and being cash flow positive for another five or six years at least. Mm. It's the biggest issue that I have with valuing Solana, but it, it could grow significantly larger in terms of the total value locked, the number of transactions being done on, a, on an annual basis or a monthly basis but the market cap may not catch up because the tokenomics aren't quite as good as the tokenomics for Ethereum. Now, add the possibility of getting a Solana ETF. And I think you could potentially, that could be one of the catalysts that takes us there in terms of market cap. So there is not a large amount in the grayscale Solana ETF at the moment. So there wouldn't be a lot of selling like there has been in the grayscale ETH ETF. Um, which has been charging ridiculously high fees and is bleeding out at the moment as people switch from that into the other lower cost um, ETF. There, there's there, there's a number of tailwinds still there for Solana, but uh, yeah, the, the tokenomics are probably the only thing that lets it down at the moment. Mm. Markets are forward-looking creatures and people do speculate on the forward-looking position. We may find that the reality of the tokenomics of it doesn't bear strongly on the speculation of the Solana price, who knows? But it's important that we've we've made a couple of statements that might have upset the Ethereum crew, as we did some time ago when we made statements with which group was that? That was Ripple. Yeah, so it did some we upset, time ago. We upset the Ripple army. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> when we upset the Ripple army, that was that was fabulously entertaining, and we appreciate all the abuse in the in the YouTube comment section. Our position here, of course, is to tell it how we see it. That might not always be correct, but it's the best of our ability, both from a both research point of view and also traveling around and attending the conferences point of view. Goes without saying, of course, this is never investment advice. This is discussion about the technology and also sometimes discussion about our investment strategy, which you don't need to follow. And certainly the people with the Ripple crew didn't follow. So great to travel to Token 2049 with you, Greg. It was a excellent conference, one of the best I've been to. I look forward to going to the next one next year and keeping everybody up to date along the way. If you want to contact us, you're welcome to do so. any comments, please leave them in the comments section at you, on the YouTube. If you're listening on a podcast, feel free to send us an email to either greg at portal.am or derek, D-E-R-Y-C-K at portal.am. See you very soon, Greg. Thanks for your time. Cheers. Thanks, Derek. Bye for now. We hope you enjoyed our weekly conversation. If you have any questions, comments, or suggested topics, please contact Nitin Gower or myself on the emails displayed here or via our LinkedIn profiles. Feel free to subscribe and share with like-minded friends. Stay well, inquisitive, and engaged. See you next week.